Welcome to our talk show, Innovation Matters. My name is Karok Ray. I'm the director of the Mays Innovation Research Center. Uh, just to remind you, our center is an academic research center here at Texas A&M dedicated to understanding innovation. And today, we are delighted to have Dr. Paul Ragsdale here with us today uh, to talk about innovation in uh, really the internal combustion engine and race cars. So, Paul, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for taking the time to visit with us here at, uh, at Texas A&M, your alma mater. Um, let's, uh, let's just get right to it. I mean, tell yeah. us about what this, what's going on here. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Craig, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Um, great to be back in Aggie land and then to talk about one of my favorite topics, innovation. Obviously cars are another a big one. Um, and so lifelong car enthusiast, my mother swears my first word was Volkswagen, um, <laughs> which it wasn't, but, uh, I could pick out the two stroke Beetle, um, the original Beetle when I was, you know, too young for, uh, most people to be able to do that. So what we have here um, is, I think, one of the best photos from you know kind of our last um, last summer, actually. Uh, and this is part of our track driving experiences that we offer through RSC Motors. Uh, and this is a capability that we're already providing to clients as we're on the path to building a hypercar that will have the highest revving production engine in a road car in history. Wow! Wow! So, uh, so, so this is your company. That's our company. And yep. um, and tell me, you're offering a service right now. We are. Tell so me about that service. We offer what's colloquially called arrive and drive. So uh -huh. clients who have cars like the GT3 RS um, or a Cayman or a BMW 3 Series who want to get out on track, who want to get faster, um, who want coaching, mechanical support during the day if uh -huh. something goes wrong. Uh, we have those capabilities because we race cars, and so we have a race trailer with all of the equipment uh, and a professional engineer who has you know won IMSA level competitions. Awesome. Okay, so the just so I understand the business, the uh, the client brings the car to the track, and uh, you provide all the support. Exactly. Support for so that. they they roll up, um, or we actually do store some clients' cars, so they can be professionally maintained on site, and then they show up in their you know their helmet and racing suit, and off they go without having uh -huh. to think about the tire pressures or the fluids or the brake pads or any of those other sorts of things that can distract from the experience. Awesome, great, great. And you're doing this in Virginia? We're doing it in Virginia at yeah. the Virginia International Raceway, a uh, legendary um, road racing course in North America, one of the most challenging, according to Car and Driver, uh, in, in the whole country. Uh, and it's just been a phenomenal community. Um, there is a technology park located just outside the race complex where there are a number of other automotive businesses. And it's just been a great environment to, you know, to kick off, um, to you know, make connections with other entrepreneurs in the space. And then of course, just a passionate automotive enthusiast base who are there. Um, because VIR is a long way from a lot of different places. And right. so the people who come to drive these cars are the people who are, you know, um, off the charts gearheads like me. Right, right, right. Awesome. And now tell me your long-term vision for this company that you founded two years ago? Two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So the long-term vision is to uh, bring a, a new hypercar to market, but that's not the end of the story because if you're going to insert yourself credibly into a conversation with Aston Martin, McLaren, or Ferrari, yeah. um, there's a whole lot more to the customer experience and uh, access driving experiences, like I said, um, but then just the the day-to-day -day customer service experience as well. Um, so we're building a luxury hypercar company um, wow. around this you know, initial offering, Chimera. So you're going to build a car? We're going to build a car. Wow. Um, it's completely audacious. I realized that when I, I set out to do this. And the one of the main lines of inspiration was Carroll Shelby. Like I grew up knowing about the Cobra legend, how he put a racing V8 into a lightweight British sports car uh, and then created a car that made history. And so when I was thinking about how to, um, to bring about an experience that was more like old school Formula One in the 90s from when I grew up, the Art and Senate era, um, I started down a path of doing a project to build my own car and pretty quickly it became apparent a lot of people were excited about this they were experiencing the same kinds of nostalgia um, as cars are becoming hybridized electrified yeah. um, and turbocharged and it fundamentally changes the driving experience and so cars like that you just saw the gt3 rs that has a four liter engine that revs to 9,000 RPM. That's one of the highest red lines currently on the market. Um, but I wanted to go higher. And so oh. how do we do that? Um, well, of course, the only solution is build your own car. Wow. 
Wow, that's a, that's that, that's ambitious, but you know, uh, it, it, it didn't stop Elon Musk. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So tell tell us how is that journey going? The 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 innovation and the the creation yeah, of a new uh, new kind of vehicle. Amazing. So first of all, I've been prepared for so many roadblocks along the way, and then um, obviously there are day to day impediments in running a business. Right. You know, running a startup is. is every bit as hard as everybody says it's going to be. And so, you know, certainly want to, to mention that. But in terms of the development, you know, we look back over two and a half years going from an idea to, you know, finding the, you know, design basis engine, to finding a chassis, to finding a gearbox supplier, um, to finding the engineer who can design it and put it all together. Um, and he's now assembling a prototype race car. So it'll be an open wheel Formula One style uh, race car uh -huh. uh, called an F1000 that will be running in SCCA regional competition starting April 8th. And then we'll be competing in three regional races uh, leading up to the runoffs. And you know, the reason we're doing that, I mean, certainly there's the marketing and outreach aspect, yeah. but we need to we need to test this thing um, in you know the most extreme conditions, and of course that is motorsport. And so your objective is to uh, build something that can compete in these races? For this year, um, right. we, we absolutely intend to be competitive, and we will be. Um, but the main thing is to understand um, the, you know, the characteristics of the engine. Um, how does it fail? Um, how does it behave? And um, how do we tune it to get maximum performance? And then for the road experience, you need to tune for drivability. So you want more torque lower in the rev range uh -huh. as opposed to necessarily peak power. Um, in the in the very high reaches, so our car is going to rev to thirteen thousand RPM. Like oh. I said, will be the highest revving production road car in history. Uh, and you know, based on that, though, to have a level of drivability, you do need to be able to have torque and in lower rev ranges. And the amazing thing is, with innovation, and I can't get into the secret sauce, but with innovation, you can get both. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. Both a combination of um, mechanical capabilities and then sophisticated engine controls, and all of these come um, from Formula One and from other oh. elite sports car series. Are you aiming for the retail market in the future? It is for the retail market. We yeah. are going to have an ultra limited run of seventy six of these cars. Uh -huh. um, Homologating a car like this for the North American market is very, very challenging, and so it's one of the things um, that we have puzzled over, um, you know, from the very beginning. One of my first meetings was with the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association uh -huh. to understand how do you bring a low volume supercar to market, right. and um, and found a path forward um, that it was something that could be done. Um, but you know, there certainly are challenges. One of the easier ones, surprisingly, is emissions compliance, um, because that is a that is a matter of engine tuning. Um, which is primarily electronic at this point, uh -huh. and then um, catalytic converters. So that's relatively straightforward. Um, the uh, federal and then state-by-state -state regulations around vehicles like this um, are, are very complex. But in any case, um, there's a path forward to do it. Uh, I do think, though, the bulk of our sales, um, the overwhelming majority, will be um, from clients in other parts of the world, and right. you know, basically people who are already you know um, passionate Formula One enthusiasts. So right. the UK, Europe, um, United Arab Emirates, uh, places like that. And these are all street legal uh, around street the world, legal. right? The, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. many other countries, in fact, most other countries, have exemptions for low volume manufacturing, uh -huh. um, and that's been a bit of a political football in the U.S. But um, I can build a car in you know my backyard in my garage, uh -huh. and then register to drive it on the road. You know, so long as the engine is emissions compliant. But the moment I do that as a company and try to sell it to someone, all the regulations that would apply to General Motors or Stellantis or to the Ford Motor Company apply to even a small builder. And so oh, one example um, of someone doing this right now uh, is Scuderia Cameron Glickhouse. They're pulling together, I believe it's the SCG004. They're competing in Le Mans. Um, and they are going through the whole crash testing process um, and building a car for the North American retail market. Wow. Okay. So if you were to build this in your backyard, mm -hmm. almost very little regulations. Exactly. As a as an individual, you can do that. Um, in Virginia, they're called um, specialty constructed cars, right. and you go through a, a process of you know safety inspections, and then also you know how was it assembled? What did you do? Um, various inspections, and then after a period of time, when they verify that all of that is accurate, right. um, you get your permit and you can get plates. 
But to do it as a company, there's a lot more red tape. So much more. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's unfortunate. We're, and in fact, that's that's the reason actually a lot of interesting cars don't come to North America. Oh, really? It's because the manufacturers, um, for whatever reason, um, this has not um, uh, been a decision that they've made to go through all of those steps to register the car. And they may have comparable crash performance, but if they don't have, they don't meet the specific regulations in our laws yeah. and of course it's no different in in the European Union um, they you know they have their own that you have to meet um, but yeah it's a, a business decision um, I see I see and that maybe that's a way in which the US regulation is is uh, in some level it's higher than around the world and we're losing innovation relative to other countries right I I, I think that's a that's a very fair <laughs> takeaway <laughs> <laughs> Wow it's uh, well that well I applaud you for 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 trying to do that. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you a, a slight story. My uh, when I was in graduate school at Stanford, mm -hmm. I had a mechanical engineering professor who was friends with a lot of venture capitalists, mm -hmm. and they, they were all driving expensive cars very fast that he couldn't afford. <laughs> so he put on top of his uh, behind his Volkswagen Beetle, he attached a jet engine to the back, <laughs> <laughs> and he would drive that to school. And, and it was he was able to get by because his. Uh, one of his, he got stopped by a police officer once, and they said, uh, well, how is this classified? And he's like, well, technically it has two engines, so it's a hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> so That's he, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well now tell me, um, this, this innovation you're doing in uh, low volume, uh, mm -hmm. high RPM uh, mm -hmm. vehicles, that is a different game than, than, even though you're regulated like the major autos like GM, totally different game, ballpark. Absolutely. Ball game, right? Yeah, uh, so you're more similar to other luxury car producers? Is that um, yes, and so great question. I mean, even if you look at companies like McLaren and Ferrari, um, yeah. they're producing thousands of units every year. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, our initial run is going to be 76. And we do have some inklings of um, additional products we're looking at um, that will be follow on to Chimera, um, which may increase our volume. Um, but for now, we know we're going to be under our 1,000 unit threshold. Um, which is the, the threshold in the EU right now um, for a lot of where their compliance starts to take effect. Right, right, right. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, a very, very basic amateur in this space, so, so part of my ignorance. But it, it, is it true to say that Porsche as a company is, is one company that's been able to straddle the, the bridge between uh, racing on one side and then the consumer market on the other? Or are there... uh, absolutely. I yeah. think um, we can, yeah, we could, we could absolutely go down the list, but I think, um, you know, Porsche certainly, um, they connect well with, with drivers, but they also connect well with um, people who are interested in design. Yeah. I mean, in addition to um, the Porsche, um, always mix it up with the car, but the Panorama magazine, you uh -huh. know, which is, you know, geared towards enthusiasts, they have another one called Christophorus, which is, you know, aimed at, you know, aimed at, you know, style and, you know, fashion and watches right. and architecture and those right. sorts of things. Um, so they've definitely found something that, that resonates with um, actually quite disparate um, groups as consumers, but then they also bring people together um, through Porsche Club events, which is, of course, a, you know, a wholly separate organization where, you know, you'll see someone um, with, you know, what look, might just look like, you know, a beautiful sports car. Um, but they're actually learning how to drive it on a skid pad and on a track and um, really getting to experience what these um, machines are all about. Um, I don't see that as much from, um, you know, some of the other marks. Um, I mean, certainly there are um, track outlets for people who own Lamborghinis and right. Aston Martins and Ferraris and so on. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's certainly a, a core part of uh, the Porsche community, which is obviously incredibly important. And in fact, Porsche are going to be at South by Southwest this weekend uh -huh. uh, in a very big way, talking about innovation, talking about, um, actually, I wish I knew what all they were talking about. They've got um, a, a cool list of seminars that they're going to be putting on um, to talk about um, yeah, modern trends, Web3, and so on, and how they interplay with um, the automotive retail market. Wow. Okay. Okay. Great. And so you're hoping that maybe you'll get some retail attention once in, in five, ten years from now. That, um, actually, that... next year. Oh, next year. Oh, so wow. yeah, oh, we great. we um, you know, so we had this audacious plan to build uh, a hypercar, and right. so so one thing that you um you have to think about in this space is most people who talk about building a sports car, most of those companies go bust. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them have been busted for fraud, um, and they certainly have defrauded investors. And I'm not going to go down the list mm -hmm. of um of bad acts, even in the in the fairly recent history. History, claiming top speed records um, that could not be verified uh, yeah. and that nobody would touch with a 10-foot pole. In uh -huh. any case, um, 
there, you have to have a foundation of you know, credibility in terms of engineering, but then there's also the, the credibility you have to establish as a community. You can't just build something and expect people to flock to it. Right. Um, you ha people have to be able to understand it, to experience it, um, and, and, and see the excellence that is there, because otherwise it's just like, okay, it's, it's essentially, it's noise uh, yeah. in the market. It's just, yeah. okay, here's another, here's another sports car. Why is this one interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, aggressive timeline, um, because of our lean manufacturing model, um, and again, um, I'm out of my depth when we start getting into those things. Yeah. Um, I'm a geneticist by training, <laughs> and I, I think cars are fascinating. Um, but in terms of yeah, the engineering and manufacturing, um, I'm definitely an amateur. And um, so I can I can parrot back some of the things that I hear uh, from our technical director, who right. is who is doing the design and then the preparation for manufacturing. Um, but what's what's interesting, and um, I, I sort of hesitate to say this, but you know, you look at you know General Motors, you look at Fiat Chrysler, which is now Stellantis, and just like defense companies, they are system integrators. And yeah. so yes, they, obviously they design products, yeah. um, but in many cases, major components, and in some cases, entire vehicles are being sourced right. um, from other entities. And so why I initially thought, well, you know, we're not designing the gearbox, we're not designing this. Not, it's like, well, no, we're providing requirements, and then just like all of the major original yeah. equipment manufacturers, we're doing system integration to create a yeah. revolutionary product. Right, right, right. Boeing same way same, a lot of businesses exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Lockheed Martin um, and again uh, you know Raytheon uh, and these others who yeah. you know I had exposure to in my career in government science and technology right. um, and that's how you that's how you get a product to market in a reasonable time scale that's right yeah that's totally consistent with what we've observed and at least I've observed in, in innovation in the uh, mm. you know over the last 50 years is this mm. the, the, the move towards outsourcing and, and really system in integration and assembly mm -hmm. yeah so let me I guess the big elephant in the room uh, Internal combustion versus electric. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. Absolutely. So first and foremost, um, I'm definitely a supporter of the electric transition. I mean, I think it's it's completely obvious, um, and you know whatever you know whatever people's takes are on. Um, it politically, I think you just look at a, a dwindling natural resource, and so there will be a point at which that it will not be you know practical to produce um, petroleum-based products. In fact, so getting back to Porsche, Porsche is coming up with synthetic fuel uh -huh. so that they can uh -huh. continue to run inter internal combustion engines in the future. Uh -huh. uh, the Italian government is actually looking to uh, the EU to try to get them to um, uh, make exemptions for Ferrari and Lamborghini to continue to produce internal combustion engines. Um, but the, you know, the really big difference, um, so batteries are just fundamentally um, different in terms of supplying energy to move a vehicle than uh, a car. So like when your battery drops um, on a scooter, a car, whatever, the car actually has less performance. That is not true with an internal combustion engine. You've got a fuel source yeah. and it's going to perform just as well, in fact, better because it's got less weight when you have um, a, a, a low tank of fuel. Um, the other thing that um, I've thought about a lot is the idea of you know, you've got range, but then you've also got the weight penalty because the batteries weigh so much. So, for example, the new Ferrari SF90, um, yeah. phenomenal machine, roughly 900 horsepower, incredible statistics. But the vehicle weighs 4,000 pounds. Uh -huh. And so um, you take a penalty for that mass in every other aspect of driving the vehicle, turning, stopping, um, and certainly accelerating and braking. And you can do a lot of really sophisticated things, and, and Ferrari and Porsche are brilliant at this um, in overcoming those inherent weaknesses, but, you know, you can't overcome the law of physics. And right. so um, while we have the ability to produce internal combustion vehicles, um, there is, uh, there's definitely a, a, a groundswell of people who are, who are interested in uh, riding that wave um, while it's still um, a possibility over really a kind of an eight year time horizon because uh -huh. that's when you know the big regulations are starting to clamp down in Europe and right. they're going to ban internal new internal combustion vehicles. Oh wow. All right. Wow. Um, now we do we speculate that there will be um, certainly a secondary market but then also um, you know, people love to drive cars on track now. Uh, yeah. We expect that that will continue yeah. um, and in the US the um, the rules for you know running vehicles like this on tracks um, are, are quite a bit more open uh, and so we we definitely see potential um, post 2030 um, or whatever the the date happens to be in the U.S. for for vehicles like this for dedicated motorsport or simply just for enjoying um, on um, an off road uh, okay. environment. Now, where the exit right now, where the technology is in mm -hmm. a in a head to head race, best electric versus best internal combustion. Yeah. who's going to win? Um, so, so that's a great question. And it, it, so it brings up. 
Oh, and one of my favorite answers is it depends. Uh -huh. And so um, one of the, I think, um, one of the really telling things about electrics, and um, so in terms of outright performance, um, I mean, right now, so if you look at, you know, Formula One, which is the pinnacle of motor racing, yeah. they are turbocharged electric hybrids. And so, and there is a, a separate series called Formula E. Um, and it, you know, we use a lot of, you know, motorsport analogies. It, it has less traction, partly because the cars sound funny. Um, mm -hmm. People are used to a particular um, sound and visceral experience. And again, those are things that we're looking um, to, um, to make available in our road car. But um, you know, they're the the power plants that the Formula One teams have now are just absolutely just phenomenal examples of engineering. Um, but they they rev lower. Um, turbochargers in general have a muffling effect on the sound of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. They tend to cause the vehicle to, um, in addition to the, the limits that have been set by the Formula One governing body, um, they tend to rev lower anyway. Um, and so, you know, they have fantastic performance, but um, yeah, the driving driving character changes. It's, um, it's, I think it's why there are a lot of people who are, you know, into classic cars, classic sports cars yeah. anyway, yeah. Um, and because there's, um, there's a level of remoteness in driving really any passenger vehicle at this point. And, you know, um, and I've, I've even blogged about this, Porsche have done a phenomenal job uh, at overcoming some of those things. Like uh -huh. for example, the, uh, the impact of turbochargers, um, like Porsche enthusiasts, um, you know, we're up in arms um, in the transition from, you know, naturally aspirated flat six engines into um, turbocharged versions. Right. And then with the Boxster, they went one level further. They went from flat sixes to turbo four cylinders. Um, but it's it's also not dissimilar from when they switched from air-cooled engines to water-cooled engines. Uh, and a lot of Porsche enthusiasts would tell you that, you know, the vehicles were, the performance was just, you know, so stellar uh -huh. um, from the change um, that, you know, you would you adapt with the time. So um, I definitely see, um, so one, um, um, a you know nearly 100% electric future absolutely so um, huge challenges for that though are just thinking about like road trips so I go frequently from the DC area where I live and where we're headquartered to the Virginia International Raceway which is four hours each way on a good day typically works out to be more like four and a half or five. Uh -huh. um, even with the highest um, amount of range um, from you know passenger vehicles at this point, there isn't any way I can practically make that trip in a day um, because the amount of time that I would have to charge at VIR to be able to make the trip back, um, I just wouldn't be able to get right, there. And right. so um, I'm excited about developments in, um, in infrastructure uh, so that there are more places to charge, um, more options for that as well, you know, greater range, higher power density, um, but then, you know, there are these unexpected um, or unintended consequences um, in the early days of hybrids. People found out that, oh my goodness, these things catch fire and they don't stop. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so there were impacts on first responders. Um, you know, some vehicles have, you know, combusted, you know, on the street or in various other places. Um, and again, they, they burn for a very long time. In some cases, it's days. So um, th those types of things I totally expect will be overcome. Um, one that I'm, in, in terms of being an enthusiast that I'm really interested in is an idea of like, how do you replace the experience of essentially refueling on a track? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you reduce the, the mass of the batteries by having fewer of them? If they're hot swappable, well then you could have a pit stop, you could change the batteries uh -huh. and then the car would go off on their own. I uh -huh. did actually see recently and then in China, they do have hot swappable batteries for taxis. Um, drive up into a little station, robot basically pulls your old battery, puts in a new one, and off you go. Right. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting, innovative approach for um, overcoming, you know, one of the um, the major limitations, which is mass. Right. One one thing that's uh, I I'll tell you, uh, we just did a conference in Fort Worth <laughs> with uh, uh, so the the Texas A and M hosted it, co co sponsored with with Hillwood, which is a big real estate developer in Fort Worth. Uh, and it was a conference all on mobility and mm. uh, on transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, and one upshot was that the consensus there was that the uh, autonomy and electrification are will need to go hand in hand, mm -hmm. and that one will not happen without the other. Um, partly because they, you know, for long haul trucking, um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's very hard for uh, to imagine autonomous trucks that will then require autonomous diesel uh, gas, whereas swapping out a battery is something robots right. can do, just like you said. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, and um, thinking about things more broadly in mobility, um, and I have thought about this a lot in terms of future proofing. Okay, so um, you know there are dinosaurs who want to you know drive on basically remnants of dinosaurs, and then um, what do you do in the future? Like, how do you? Um, and, and there's always a space for for people to come up with you know creative ways to to enjoy these yeah. um, things. But um, and then um, yeah, mobility and long distance. Um, are some really fascinating things. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot about, like, the kind of car that I drive. Like, uh, this isn't the kind of car I would drive every day. Right. Um, this is the kind of car I would drive for specific purposes, and I love driving on a track, and I'm going to drive a dedicated track car. But, like, for getting around town, like, we just... You know, um, I know it's 2022, and it's kind of a surprise to say we just bought our first plug-in hybrid, um, but we did, and I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. So uh, back to this, this topic I mentioned earlier, jet engines. Uh, mm -hmm. We we had a speaker last month. Anyone watching, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, David Maiman, from the founder of Jetpack Aviation. Mm. And so he built his first product was a jetpack, a little like little like a GI Joe okay. jetpack that you yeah. can fly, makes you fly. Uh, but then his second uh, product is a essentially a flying car. It's a oh, looks fantastic. like a jet ski, yeah. but it, it, it you know it goes up. It can fly. It can go up to fifteen thousand feet and then fly. Yeah. And uh, I asked him about the uh, you know like the same question: electric versus mm -hmm. internal combustion. For the flying car aspect, mm -hmm. it, it turns out that we're nowhere near as mm -hmm. close for the uh, the energy density for an electric battery that we need to be able to fly right. for a flying car. So the jet fuel is still way way more efficient. When it comes to that, at least that use case. Yeah, absolutely. I've talked to. Well, so this is interesting. Um, you know, you think about uh, traffic and uh, and barriers. So living in the DC area, obviously one of the most congested metro regions in the country. Um, and I've spent way more time in traffic than yeah. I care to remember yeah. um, doing that. And so you know, the idea of like literally being above it all. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we actually have been um, working with an air taxi service in the local area uh -huh. um, to get back and forth to VIR because um, 95 is always a challenge. Right. 95 between you know DC um, and you know go up and down the eastern seaboard, um, but the idea of having and of course the the safety and regulations around this are um, you know kind of fascinating. Yeah. But the the ability actually you know not to be in a fixed traffic pattern on the ground to be, to be able to you know go short distances in the air would be phenomenal. Um, but yeah, talking to the to the pilots, um, yeah, electric planes they're you know they're in testing stages. Um, but yeah, and then again you've got the weight penalty, which is um, much more profound when you're you know, trying to achieve lift yeah. um, to, yeah, to fly. Can you share with us some of the, the main challenges to innovation or obstacles to innovation that you've uh, come across in, uh, in this project of, of building a new hypercar and how you, yeah. how you, how you overcame those obstacles? No, oh, it's, it's a fantastic question. So I think um, one of the biggest ones, and not picking on regulations specifically, um, but finding how, how you can, you know, legally and safely, you know, put together um, a product like this um, was something we had to give a lot of consideration. And the first and foremost um, is I had to understand what the emissions compliance regulations were going to be. And I cannot tell you how many times people said, oh, no, you can't do that. It's prohibitively expensive. Well, it turns out it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, and so that was one of the big takeaways I had from my government career is in, okay, how do you achieve outcomes basically given the, t the tools you know that you have at your disposal? Um, and so there are certain fixed constraints. And I think... Um, totally separate conversation we're seeing that with web3 and crypto um, and you know the um, you know the big judgment um, that you know certain assets were actually considered securities and should have been registered uh, leading to to major fines um, so you have to understand how you can do that um, you know w without it running afoul of the, of the regulators because in our case um, we've literally been told that if we do it incorrectly that you know our vehicles will be seized by customs and crushed right. um, and so that's not really that's not a, a good long-term strategy um, so so um, you, you start with your, your fixed constraints, um, and for me, it, it's a it's a process of, um, and this was definitely something that I, I learned while I was here in graduate school at AM. Um, I, I, I guess I couch it as kind of you know steeping yourself in the data, um, or in immersing yourself in the problem, and so that you you have sufficient understanding of what you need to overcome to get a particular outcome, then you look at essentially the, um, the landscape of paths that you can take to get there. 
Um, and then um, for me, it's a process of reflection. Um, I love this idea of deliberation without attention. There used to be a lot of research in that space. I haven't kept up with it. Um, but I find that, um, yeah, mulling over something, letting it steep, sleeping on it, all those things are just really helpful uh -huh. to, to have that, that flash of, oh my goodness, okay, this is, how, this is how we solve that particular problem. And in some cases, it's pretty quick. Um, in other cases, for me, um, it, it can take you know months um, or longer. Yeah.